Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're gonna look at making a neon sign generator like this, where the neon tubes, the stand placement, and the cabling are all procedural. This is a bit of a long one, so let's jump right into it. To get started, we're just gonna add a node tree to this cube. And since we want our neon sign to have text, we'll add a string to curves node. Now our text is laying flat on the ground, but we'd rather have it vertical. So we're gonna rotate this 90 degrees. We'll add a geometry, transform node, and rotate it 90 degrees on the X axis. Also, the string to curve node creates curve instances. So there are four separate instances here, one for each letter. We wanna make those into a single curve with different splines. This one, this word will actually generate five splines, one for each letter, and then the O has two splines. So to do this, we'll simply add a Realize Instances node. Next, we want to split these splines at their ends, like a neon tube would be. Since string to curve letters are set as cyclic, if we set them as not cyclic, that will break the loops of the letters. We'll do that with a curve set spline cyclic node. By default, cyclic is off, so now these letters are non-cyclic. However, the gaps are way too big. So to reduce these gaps, we want the control points to be closer together. And to do that, we'll need more of them. To get more control points on our curves, we'll use a resample curve node. Now the two modes of the resample curve node are the count mode, which puts a set number of points in each curve, or we can use the length mode, which makes the points a set amount apart. I'm gonna use this the length mode and then reduce the length. If I reduce the length to 0.01 meters, you'll see I have a tiny gap between the start and end of my splines. And now I have 1600 control points. The next thing I wanna do is have my neon sign be pushed out where the tubes are and have the endpoints still resting on the side of the wall here. I'm gonna add in a wall for reference. And then I'm gonna add a set position node. I want my sign to come out along the Y axis away from the wall. Since this direction is the negative Y, I'll have this come out negative 0.1 meters. So now if I look at side view, here's my wall and here's my sign. At this point, I'm gonna solidify this curve by adding a curve to mesh node and then adding a curve circle as my profile. We'll bring the size way down. Next, we only want the tube part of our neon sign to be pushed out from the wall we want our endpoints to be pushed back. So in our set position node, we can use our selection to do that. We can use the curve endpoint selection node and plug that into the selection. You will see that initially that gives us the opposite of what we were going for. So to invert that, we'll simply use a utility Boolean math node and set it to not. Now these endpoints might be a little too close together we can use the endpoint selection node to increase this width. You can adjust this to whatever size you like. Now that we've got the basic shape of the tube down, let's go ahead and add in our materials. On my sign object, I'll go to my materials tab and set the first material to neon. We'll change the emission color to a neon color and give it an emission strength. After my curve to mesh node, I'll add a set material node and choose the neon color. I'm gonna jump over to viewport shading and we'll see that the neon color has been assigned. I'm gonna hide our background plane for a moment. Next, we wanna color the ends a different color than the neon sign. We'll create a second material and call it ends. And we'll give it a dark gray color. We'll duplicate our set material and change the material to ends. You'll see when we do this, it changes all of the materials to the new color. We'll have to use the selection to only change the ends we want. We can reuse our endpoint selection if we like, but one problem that we'll run into is if we plug this endpoint selection into this set material, it doesn't give us the result that we're looking for. That's because this node is being evaluated against the curve. But here, the curve is being changed into a mesh, and so it becomes a new context. We have to have a way of changing the context from the curve and getting that across to the mesh. That's done with a capture attribute node. 
if we add a capture attribute node here, right before the curve becomes a mesh, we can grab this information. The information we want to grab is a Boolean, and it's this endpoint selection. Now that we've captured that, we can take this and plug it in over here. You can see now that the first part of this curve has been changed the material. But we want to change more of this tube than just this very end. So instead of using this endpoint selection, we're going to duplicate it and plug that in. Now we have separate control over how much of the ends are changed material-wise. There, that looks pretty good. That pretty much takes care of the tubes, so let's clean up our tree a little bit. I'm going to grab these nodes and press Ctrl J to frame them. I'll press F2 to give it a name and call it Neon. And under the end panel, under node, I'll change the label size to something a little larger. The next thing we'll need are the stands that hold the sign in place. Now we could create these completely procedurally, but I felt that was a little beyond the scope of this tutorial and it was already kind of long. So I'm just going to model up something simple real quick. There, that's pretty simple, but it'll get the job done. You'll also notice that I placed the center point of the stand here at the middle of the clip because that's the point on the curve that we're going to instance these on. I'm going to take this stand and move it out of the way. Going back to our node tree, we're going to want to instance this stand on our main curve. Our main curve was right here, so I'm going to add a reroute here, drag this up, drop it, and type in reroute. I'm going to drag in my stand and add an instance on points node. My points are my curve, my instances are my stands, and then down here I'll add a join geometry and then add in my stands. Immediately, you might see a bit of a problem. We now have 1600 stands. That's a few too many. We only want a few. As I was first working on this tutorial, I thought that resampling the curve might be a good solution. The problem with that is if you have a font with a lot of curves in it, the shape of your letters is going to start drastically changing as you reduce the resample count. Instead, I decided to use the selection of our instance on points along with a modulo operator to get a fewer amount. So if we take the index of our point and use a math node set to modulo and then use a compare node in integer mode set to equal and then plug that result into the selection, we can now say when the modulo of a certain number of the index is equal to zero, we want that point to be instanced. So if we want every 10th stand, we could type in 10 here. Still, we've got way too many, so I'm just going to slide this value up until we get an am amount that looks good. There, that looks pretty decent. If I go into side view, you will see an additional problem. There's been a stand instanced on the endpoint. So what I'm going to have to do is put an extra condition in of when I don't want a stand. So to add a condition, I need a Boolean. I'll go to Boolean math and drop this on. So now I say when the modulo 500 in the index is equal to zero, I want the stands and when it's not an endpoint. So I'll add in curve endpoint selection duplicate this boolean and set it to not, and then plug that in here. So now this little part of the node tree reads like this. When the instant point is not an endpoint, and that point modulo 500 is equal to zero, I want stands. So now I no longer have any stands instanced on my endpoints. The last thing we need to do with the stands is make sure they're aligned properly. Of course, the ones that are straight up and down like this are fine. But if we look here, this one's going into the tube, and these ones on the curve aren't aligned at all. So we can use the rotation of our instance on points to get these set correctly. We're going to align the stands by using the tangent of the curve, which you can consider as the direction the curve is pointed, changing that into a rotation, and plugging that into the instance rotation. So if I go to curve, and grab the curve tangent node, and then 
the Align Euler to Vector node. This takes a vector and changes it into a rotation. So I'll take my tangent and put it into the vector and then add the rotation and put it into the rotation. Now you may notice some strange things going on. We have to set the axes correctly for these to work. Because our stand was built coming out along the Y axis, you can think of that as the axis we want to turn these objects. So our pivot is going to be the Y axis. And then you'll want to choose the proper axis to align to the vector. Since the Z axis of our object runs through the clip at the top, we'll change this to Z. And when we do that, we can see that our objects are lined up correctly with our curves. Let's go ahead and put this into rendered mode to see how we're doing. That's looking pretty good. Let's clean up our node tree and then move on to our wires. Now for our wires, I wanted to run a wire from each spline to the next spline. And as we remember from before, we have five splines now in this object. So our wire will be a five point spline. And the positions of those five points will be the start points of our five splines we currently have. The issue is that our text splines have a total of 1600 points and we only want to take five of those points and put them into our new spline. And because we used the length mode of resample, we don't know how many points are in each letter. So we're going to have to get at them a little differently. Taking our main curve and pulling it down, I'm going to add another reroute node. The first thing we want to do is create our new spline. When you need to create a new spline, the easiest way to do that is with a curve line node. If we control shift click on curve line and then look over in our spreadsheet, we'll see that we have two control points and one spline. We've already said we want five control points. To change this from two control points to five, we'll use a resample curve node. And we could change this to any number we wanted. However, we want this to be dynamic because later we're going to want to be able to change the text of our node, or maybe not even use text at all and use some other curve. So how do we get the number of splines from our previous curve? We can do that with the domain size node. So under attribute, we'll choose domain size. We'll change the mode to curve and plug in our geometry. We can take our spline count and plug that into our resample curve. When we do that, we see now that our new curve has five control points. Of course, these are just in a straight line and we'll want to set new positions for them. So we'll add a geometry set position node. But how do we grab the five start points from our previous splines? We're going to take a little side detour and take a look at the curve resample node and see how we can exploit it. I'm going to add in just a regular Bezier curve. Adding a node tree to it, I'm going to add a curve resample node. As I reduce the count, you'll see the curve gets more and more jagged. When it reaches two points, all that are left are the start point and the end point. The start is at negative 100 and the end is at 100. If I reduce this to just one, I'm left with negative 100, which is the start point. So if I take my original curve and resample it down to one, I'll be left with the five start points of the five splines. I'll duplicate this resample curve node and bring it over and plug in my original curve into it. I'll change the count to one and I'll control shift click on this node. As you can see, we've got five positions. We can use these to drive the five positions of our new line and we can easily do that with a transfer attribute node. Because positions are vectors, we'll change this to vector mode and change the mode to index because we want the five indices of these points to be the new positions of these points. The attribute I want to copy is the position and we're just going to leave the index alone because it's zero to four here and zero to four here. And then I'll plug this attribute into the position. So now the five positions of this curve are being set by the start points of the five splines we had previously. I'll take the output of this and join it in with the rest of my geometry. So now you see we have a line going from the start point of our five splines. Because I want this to be a cable, I'm going to add a curve to mesh. 
at a curved circle as the profile, reduce the radius, and now we've got a cable. We'll want to give it a material, so I'll add a new material to my object, and I'll set it to a flat black. I'll call it cable, and I'll add a material, set material node, and choose cable. I'm going to increase the radius just a little bit. Now this cable doesn't look great because it's such a straight line. If you've seen my previous videos on creating drooping cables, I'm going to use a node group asset that I've created previously in this project. I'll put a link down in the description where you can download the blend file that contains this node as an asset. Because in Blender 3.2 Alpha, node trees have now been enabled as assets. So if I open my asset browser and go to my node category, I have a catenary node. If I drop this on the curve before I change them to a mesh, I get nice drooping cables. To keep things clean, I'll grab these nodes and press Ctrl J and rename them. If I want, I can grab the string input from my string to curves and bring it to my group input. And now I can change this to anything I like. Of course, I don't have to use the string to curves node to drive this. I could use any curve that I wanted. And if that curve has multiple splines, I'll get a cable between them. So that's it for this one. I know it was a bit of a doozy, but I hope you learned something along the way. If you did, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. As always, I hope this inspires you to make something awesome. And until next time, I'll catch you later.